Um, just, just now I'm thinking, um, I probably spent almost two years knowing that I must have anger at my mum and not wanting to feel it, or not being able to feel it. And in the last month I'm thinking, yeah, I can start feeling some anger now. Yep. I think before I didn't want to because I've got this thing that I learned from her that I have to make her feel happy and I don't, can't make her feel bad. But you threw me a bit before when you said about I want my dad to hurt. And I'm, because I, I'm trying to feel anger at my mum now, I don't think I'm doing very well there. Yep. Because I get angry and then nothing happens. It doesn't seem to change much. But this, am I actually wanting her to feel bad? Is that something that I'm doing wrong? Um, well, let's firstly, um, in a, next weekend, I'm going to give a talk about mothers. Yeah. Right? Um, what I'm finding is that, um, it'll be on Saturday, uh, what I'm finding is that um, the majority of people on the planet are still having a lot of problem with their mother-based emotions. Right? And uh, there's a lot of very good reasons why they're having a lot of problems with, with their mother-based emotions. So that's a, probably a separate issue that I'd like to discuss in a whole four-hour session. The issue I'd like to address, though, is, is the production of rage or, you know, how we finish up accessing an emotion. Remember I've said that underlying everything is generally some grief that we need to feel. And then on top of the grief, there is usually some fear. And then on top of the fear, generally, there is anger. And on top of the anger, oftentimes, there is rage, which is extreme, or resentment, hatred, right? Uh, so you could think of right, that place. And then on top of that is a place where we start to go numb. Right? Because it's all too much. And what's happened for a lot of your life is that you have been quite numb to the majority of your own emotions. If you even think of what's happening with your body and your own connectiveness to your own body and its feelings, you can see that you're quite numb there as well in a lot of ways. And the numbness is sort of the top layer of the denial of the soul. Right? So, so obviously what's going to hap happen in the process of working through emotion is you're going to get from there to there to there to there and get your way down into the actual causal emotion that's, that's inside of you, right, at some point. Now, now you're, you've been in a lot of... When we're numb, we often convince ourselves that we're in a state that we're not in. Right? So we say, no, I don't feel that, no, I don't feel that, no, I don't feel that. And the truth is we don't feel it because we are just numb to it. We've, we've, it's a bit like um, if you, if you there, is a, it, there is a body response where you can detune from your own pain, as you know as a doctor, right? Where people do detune from their own pain. And, and this is the whole point of some of the drugs, right? Like morphine, for example, is to disconnect the pain from the body so that, the, so that, so that the, the body might be in pain, but the person themselves doesn't feel the pain that the body is in. Does that make sense? There is that disconnect. And you can do that emotionally too, exactly the same thing. Emotionally, you can disconnect from your body's own pain. And the majority of us do that not only with our body, but also with our emotions. We disconnect from our emotions to avoid all of our emotional pain. And we finish up doing a lot of things, which is another thing that has been very habitual for yourself. Being very active all the time, always doing, getting up early in the morning from daybreak to day sunset, there's just something filling up your day, do you know what I mean? In a way to avoid how you're feeling. And there's a lot of ways that we have to break down, and you have been breaking these down over the last couple of years, breaking down all of these patterns that cause you to be able to maintain the numb state emotionally. So now that you're starting to break down some of those patterns, what's going to happen is you'll start feeling some of the underlying emotion, uh, the anger or whatever. But remember, in between this and this, there are a whole set of beliefs. Right? In between that and that, there are a whole set of beliefs. Beliefs. Uh, and so forth. Every, in between every stage, in fact, there are a whole set of beliefs that need to be de deconstructed for you to become the normal childlike self that you will become. Now, the beliefs between numb and rage are all to do with things about rage. For example, 
if you're if you're in a rage, you're not spiritual. If you're in a rage, people are going to get angry back. If you're in a, you know, there's all these. I'm going to get punished if I'm in a rage. But when you're a child, the only times you ever got a, in a rage, can you remember them? Most of the time, you got a belting usually for them, and and so you understand rage, punishment, rage, punishment. Not allowed to have rage because I'm going to get hurt physically, hurt through rage. And then there's a lot of beliefs about God in that place as well. If I get into a rage, God's not going to love me anymore. God's going to punish me, you know, and all those kind of things. There's a lot of things about God in in the rage, in the belief. So when I deconstruct the belief, that's when the above state disappears. Do you follow me? So if I deconstruct the beliefs about rage, then the above state of numbness disappears from my life. So you're still in the process of deconstructing the beliefs about rage and anger. Does that make sense? Now when you deconstruct your beliefs about rage and anger, what is going to happen? Your fear will be exposed. And when you deconstruct your, fear, your beliefs about fear, the underlying causal grief will just naturally come up. So that's the process of the soul. Now these beliefs, the beauty of these beliefs is beliefs can be deconstructed at any point in time. So in other words, you can work on multiple beliefs at the same time. Right? And many beliefs disappear with one truth. So for example, the truth. I, God created me to experience every one of my own emotions. That's a truth. When I accept that truth in my heart, all of a sudden lots of beliefs will disappear. Like a belief, I can't cope. That's going to disappear, isn't it? If I believe that God constructed me to cope with and feel all of my own emotions in my heart, then will I ever believe again that I can't cope? I won't. Right? I'll know that I'll get through everything automatically with that. So I can deconstruct a belief or accept, accept one truth and that one truth can, dis, can deconstruct literally tens or even sometimes hundreds of beliefs in that one moment. Right? I, um, I think I've got a lot of fear about feeling things. but um, Is the mic on? Yeah, it's still on. Oh, Just talk a bit yeah. closer now, is it? But... Um, from what you're saying, obviously I can't intellectually believe that I can cope with all my emotions. That doesn't do it. No. How do I get to emotionally believe that I can cope with all my emotions? Well, I suppose the question really has a big broader brush than what the question you've just asked, and that is, and that is intellectually believing something doesn't make it true. No. Emotionally believing something is the only time it becomes true. So how do I emotionally believe anything is really the question, isn't it? Not just how do I emotionally believe a thing about fear, but how do I emotionally accept anything? Well, before all this, I was, I was going to say, like, I think I'm, I'm quite good at recognising what emotions are, what's going on for me, but I'm just no good at getting to the... Well, the issue you're facing... Expressing the feeling that I... Have. Yeah, the issue you face, Karen, is that you have spent a lot of your life in your intellect yes. and therefore a lot of your life being able to disassemble things intellectually quite easily. But I can't do the next... But you're finding it very difficult to do it emotionally. Yes. And the reason why is because you're so far removed from that child who is able to do it emotionally perfectly every time. Yes. Who's inside you, by the way, right at this moment. So she's still there... And she's able to do it perfectly emotionally every time. Yeah. So, so the, the real question then becomes, well, how do I allow the emotional process to occur rather than me always going back to the intellect again? Yeah. Right? And the only way that can happen is by me dis deconstructing the, emotion, the belief system that I have around emotions. So you but need to do, to do work. That, I have to do that at an emotional level. Yes, at an emotional level, at a soul-based level. And that's, I think, where I get very frustrated because I think I say all these convoluted prayers to God like, my mind wants this, but can you help me help my soul to want this because my soul doesn't seem to want anything. Yeah, um, yeah, but can you see how even that prayer isn't harmonious with, well, with the truth? I'm kind of stuck as to what to do. Well, let's, let's look at this. When you pray to God, my prayers to God, I, 
aren't right either. So. Well, let's look at this. My mind wants this. Why would I say that to myself? Because I've learned that obviously my soul can't want it because it's not happening. I think I'll yeah, so, my mind so wouldn't it be more positive to say, it's not happening, so I don't want it? Rather yeah. than saying, my mind wants it. I do. I say, it's not happening, I don't want it. Can you help me want it? And I know that you're only hearing the words and I don't know how to do the feelings, so can you help me with that? No, but, no, but can you see, even in your statement, that you're saying to God, your mind wants it, you have it, that is justifying to yourself that you still want it. You'd be far better of saying, I bloody well don't want it, wouldn't you? Yeah, I've tried that. <laughs> yeah, and... Um, for a few hours I have peace because I think, oh good, I don't have to go back to my old life, which is quite good. Yeah. But, you know, I've got this pull, I'm on the end of a fishing line, I keep getting pulled back. Yeah, so something's pulling you along. Yeah, yeah. and it's towards frustration usually. <laughs> so, so, but when I, can you see what I'm saying? When you say to yourself, your mind wants it, you're just giving yourself an out? So I, I would firstly give up saying to myself, I want this. Yeah. Like, like I don't say to myself, I really badly want this any, any time at all. The reason why is because if, I'm not, if it's not happening right now, I don't want it. Yeah. Right? Yeah. If I really wanted it, it would be happening right now. Right? So, the, so the fact that if, if it's not really happening right now, then I don't want it. At any level, mind or otherwise. Forget about the mind and the soul being separate or whatever else. Just forget about the whole thing and just say, well, I don't want it. I don't, all I do is I go, I don't want it. And then I let myself feel what that feels like. How much I don't want it. Right? Mary's really good at this. Like, she, if she says like to herself, like, I don't want to you know, do a workshop. She'll go, she'll go straight into it. I really, you know, she'll get really, she'll feel her anger about how much she doesn't want it and really, and within a few seconds she's in grief because she really allows herself to feel the feeling that she doesn't want something. Yeah? I don't want my soulmate. Away you go. I don't want, you know, God. I don't want to be in front of people. I don't want to, you know, just substitute what you don't want in that. Right? Yep. And really own it. Like the only thing I can suggest is just really settle into the emotion of it. Right? Yeah, I mean, you, I, you don't let yourself settle into the emotion of it. I'm just saying that looks like somewhere I can go because I can get angry with that. But I'm remembering now I've done in the last few weeks I've been had extended periods of anger. But then I think a week or so ago I was listening to an MP3 where. You and Mary said, if you're in anger for more than a minute, then it's not working. And I'm thinking, oh, God, I'm not allowed to do extended periods of anger. But no, I've never said you're not allowed to be. No. I've, I've just I've said, because I've said you're allowed to be anything, haven't I? Yeah, yeah, I know. But okay. I'm saying to myself, yeah, I but see, be doing it wrong. Don't misquote my words to even to yourself or to others. No, I was saying, I said, I'm not allowed to do it. I know that's what you said. And I've, I've said that you're allowed to do anything. Yeah. Right? So let's be honest. Like... You're allowed to do anything. You're allowed to be in a rage for the next six months if you want to be. Do you follow me? You're allowed to be in a rage for the next six months. If you're in a rage for the next six months, it's not going to help you because there's some belief systems in there that are not being deconstructed that you could easily deconstruct if you wanted to. Right? If you're going to stay in a rage for six months, you can do it. You're allowed to. Not many people are going to be want to be around you. Well, you do it. That's the only problem. <laughs> and and probably you're not even going to be want to be around yourself while you're doing it. The key with ang with anger is what I said earlier, and that is that when I personally know that I am able and I am the only person able to feel all of my own emotions, then I take full responsibility for that emotionally. But the truth is that you're not taking full responsibility for that emotionally. You do not believe at the soul level. Intellectually, I know you've got a clever mind and you can see all the logic in what I'm saying, but that doesn't help because it's not going to be an emotional truth inside of you until you feel it, and this is the struggle that you've got at the moment. You're still wanting to retain the mind rather than feel the emotion. 
Now, can I just go back to something that happened in your personal life? Right? Um, when you were removed from Mary's workshop, you had some rage come up. Can you remember it? Okay. Now, you only allowed yourself to stay in that rage, right, for the night, didn't you? You stayed in the rage for the night. But, and by the morning, how were you feeling? I went home and I went through all of that and I had lots and lots of hours and days of anger. Yeah. So the initial was rage and then you went into anger, right? Now what happened with it? Can you tell me what happened with it? Well, it's, it's very up and down, you know, because like it, it went to my mum. That's the beginning of me realising that I had anger at my mum. And I mm -hmm. didn't, and I thought, oh, and I thought, oh, that's good. But then it, it'd be very up and down. Yep. And, um, and can you see again, why would you be angry with your mum? Do you want all the reasons why I'm angry at my mum? Yeah, yeah. Um, because... I can see now that her unspoken, sorry, her unspoken message to me of make me happy, um, I've been quite furious at feeling that I've always had to make her happy. Right. Um, I guess that's the biggest one. So that's a core emotion in you, isn't it? Yeah. That you need to feel some grief about always having to make mum feel happy. How did that feel? Well, yeah, I've, when I'm angry, sometimes I'm angry and then I cry. But Can you see when I'm angry about that, I'm not actually feeling it? Like, no, no, no. I, 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 down I'm, below, how do you really feel? How do you feel I, about I, having had your life, all yeah. your childhood, with your mum basically making you feel whatever she feels and making her happy? Yeah, sometimes I can feel the childhood grief and then I feel better, but I, either there's a whole lot more that I have to keep going back to, or so, sometimes so, I just so I get why, angry and it won't why, go. Karen, Karen, why are you blocked to feeling the grief? The grief is right there. You said if you allowed yourself to feel yeah. the grief of why your mother, like how oppressive this felt... Just allow yourself to feel how oppressive it was. Yeah, I do think I'm just too chicken to be overwhelmed. I do think that. And that's the blockage and that's what creates your anger. Yeah. So, so the belief, can you see the belief is back at the same belief I've stated right at the beginning? The belief that I've talked about with Libby? The belief that... That I want to punish her? No, no. It's the belief inside of yourself that, that hasn't I... entered you yet. That, that, I that you are totally responsible and the only person that can feel your own emotion. Yeah. That belief hasn't entered you yet. No, and you're saying just before, I have to start saying why I don't want it and maybe that process will get me But there. But when you allow the belief, because it's about process of allowing, when you allow this belief, this truth, to settle in your soul, and that is the truth that only you can feel your own emotions and God created you perfectly to feel your own emotions, and when that truth actually enters you emotionally, what will happen is you will automatically feel the grief of how much you were controlled by your mum. Yeah. Does and, that make you, sense? Yes, but you're saying to me, for the truth to enter me emotionally, I have to start by saying I don't want to feel it and being... Well, no, I'm just saying the truth is you don't want to. You've got to tell yourself the truth. Yeah. You don't want to. And, and you don't want to feel this grief. That's the truth. Yeah, I worked that out. That's why you're not feeling it, because yeah. you don't want to feel it. Yeah, I, I worked and, it out. And you I prefer feel... anger instead because you have the belief that you cannot cope with your emotion. That's the belief, right? You have a belief that somebody else should have to. My children, my family, my mother, my mother preferably, but most of us, as we'll talk about next week, we, then, we very rarely focus on my mum should have to. Our dad, we were a bit more accepting of having to. And then what we do is we say, oh, you know, and so we'd be angry at the person we feel should have to feel it for us. That's what we do. But that comes from this underlying non-acceptance of the basic belief. And the basic belief that we need to have enter our soul is, at some point in time I've got to come to realise that only I can. Nobody else can. And I've got to feel that here. Right? And if I don't feel that here, I need to pray about that a lot. 
only I can. Help, you know, ask for God's help to help you see that only you can feel your own emotion. Only you. And that God created you to do it. And this is a process really of having faith in the process. Does that make sense? At the moment, you don't have any faith in the process. You have an intellectual concept of the process without faith of it. So when you have faith in it, you'll go, it'll settle in you as a belief system, as a complete belief in your soul, it'll settle. Wow, only I can feel my own emotion. Nobody on this planet, nobody who's ever harmed me, nobody who's ever did, done anything to cause me pain can actually feel the pain I'm in. I am going to have to feel it, me. And ironically, when you accept that belief in your soul, that's when God can help you because now you're feeling your own emotion. Before that point in time, God can't even help you at all because you're always projecting at somebody else that somebody else should be feeling your emotion for you and it's impossible. It's a total impossibility. There's not a single other person in this room or on this planet who is capable of understanding your emotion. Does that make sense? Nobody can. Nobody can. So why do you expect them to? Can you see expecting them to is just uh, uh, like all you're doing is setting yourself up for anger by expecting them to? You, as soon as you come to realise at soul level that actually nobody can, it, and it makes total sense that nobody can because the, the emotion's inside of you. And how can somebody else feel what's inside of you and experience what's inside of you and feel it as you feel it? Nobody can. So, so at some point I've got to give up this desire for everybody around me to do that. And, and that's when you'll give up anger. And I'm saying until that point you need to still feel your anger. Does that make sense? So don't turn off your anger, feel it still, but you've got to understand that your anger is still this choice to not accept that belief. Do you follow me? So I'm not saying don't feel your anger. I'm saying feel your anger, but understand that your anger is the result of a lack of faith in your own capacity to feel your own emotion. You know, I had this intellectual concept <laughs> that, oh, now I'm getting into my anger at my mum and I'm chipping away at my big blob of anger at my mum. And so eventually it'll all be chipped away and gone. But am I just kidding myself there? Well, the truth is that all of your anger will go towards a person when you accept the truth inside of your soul that nobody else can feel your emotions. All of your anger towards everyone will disappear so at that point. Yes, yeah, so there's, it doesn't necessarily have to be a big blob of anger. To no, really no, a lot of times we have just one belief that can just get rid of anger to everybody. Okay. Like, and, the, and the one primary belief is the one that I've kept on mentioning to you. Yeah. Yeah. It's, a, it's that belief. And it's only that belief that can help you. Right? And so like, one of the things myself and Mary have been talking about a lot is having the faith in that that belief is true. That God actually created you as a perfect soul, totally able to be fully self-sufficient in experiencing its own emotion. That, that is a very primary belief. And I'm very afraid of that. Yeah, well, <laughs> being afraid of it is another s situation, right? That, that's a different situation. Once you accept the belief, even your fear won't matter anymore. And the reason why it won't matter anymore because you'll believe that you can experience your terror just as much as you can experience any other emotion because God created you to do it. Do, do you follow me? Like... We only go crazy when we feel we can't cope. That's when we go crazy. If you have a belief in you that you are and have been created in this way, then you will cope because automatically the belief system is stating that God created you to cope. And it is a truth, by the way. It's not just a belief that someone has manufactured. It is a truth. If, and you think about it. If God created everything perfectly, then surely God created your soul perfectly. Now, if God created your soul perfectly, then God must have created your soul to experience everything that's inside of your soul perfectly. And if God created that, then that means that every emotion that's inside of your soul, whether it's shame, guilt, terror, fear, 
anger, rage, resentment, hatred, any, any emotion, God created you capable of feeling those emotions and not having somebody else sharing them. Every single one of those emotions, love included. Right? So if that's the case, and that's the basic truth, then every time I'm angry, I'm not believing that truth. Every time I'm angry. Um, can we just whack on the lights? I think they're up the back there, Brian, somewhere. Um, I think they're over there on that wall. Does that make sense, Karen? Yeah. So, so pray about that. Like a lot of times, what we do is we get very embroiled in the the, the one emotion after the other emotion, and we don't realise actually that accepting divine truth can actually get rid of whole blocks of blockages in just one with just one wipe of a brush, right? as long as it's an emotional acceptance of that truth. Right? And, uh, and so that's why in my own life I've had very little um, anger to deal with because I've accepted, like, to a large degree, accepted that truth that only I can feel what I'm feeling. It's totally impossible for anyone else on this planet, in any incarnation that you have, for anyone else on this planet to actually feel what you're feeling. Does that make sense? Totally impossible. You need to talk into the mic if you're going to be heard. I just I... said I'll try and get it to the emotional level. Yeah. Yes. Yep, that's it. And can we come across the... Yeah. Yeah. Is it working? Yeah. Um, I know you don't want to talk about mums, but I'm one of them. And uh, what happens when you're um, uh, in a situation where anger is being directed at you quite strongly... From your mother? No, from my sons. From your sons, yeah. and, um, and you don't want to walk away from them because you want to help them. And you understand that they're, you know, you understand a lot of what they're going through that they're not being able to access. And you're going through a lot of emotion yourself. And uh, I just get uh, totally bamboozled about what to do because I want to do the right thing. Well, can, can I firstly suggest, number one, don't help anymore. What, what if you've made mistakes in the past uh, through your own ignorance and you want to help now because you think maybe... Now, can I just stop you for a moment, though? Yeah. The whole assumption that you can help your child get through their anger is based on the fact that you feel that you weren't the creator of their anger. Weren't the creator? No, I do feel that I'm the creator of their anger. No, you don't. Because if you did feel you were the creator of their anger, they would stop getting angry with you. You see, this is a basic thing about the law of attraction with anger. Let's say, like, here, here's two people. Here's you, here's your grown children, let's say. How old? 34. 30? 30. 36. 36. Son? And 34. 34. Okay. Now, now, who created their emotions towards the female? Me. And? It's not just you. Oh, and probably my husband, yeah. It's, it's any male who's been in their life and any female who's been in their life, basically, isn't it? But obviously, primarily, yourself. There's a large influence that you've had on their life, right? Now, with your, assu your assumption that the first thing is you said to me is, I want to help them not do that anymore. I want to help no, them. Not, not, not do it. To access their emotions, you know, like because... No, no, but how can you help them access their emotions when you don't even access yours? Well, I do. I feel terrible about it. I mean, I, inside I'm all churned up and... Uh, no, just the assumption that you can help them without firstly dealing with I'm the I'm not emotion. trying to be... Um, can you see how resistant... I'm not trying to be arrogant. Can you see how... Yes, you are. I'm sorry, but you are being arrogant with your children. You're being oh. arrogant because you are actually thinking that you can help them. And isn't that arrogance? If I think I can help you, isn't that arrogance? How would I know if I can help you? I'm a mother. Ah, see, see a false a... belief? What's it got to do with your being her, their mother? Because he's, I'm the only person he has got. Because he doesn't... Ah, see. He has isolated himself from everybody. You're not the only person he's got. 
And to be honest, he doesn't need another person to feel his own emotions. He only needs himself and his relationship with God to feel any emotion. He doesn't need you. You want him to need you. And that's part of the problem. No, no, I'd rather be away from the whole problem. Sorry? I would rather be away from the whole problem. You would rather be away... You need to speak a bit louder. I'm sorry. I would rather be away from the problem than have to deal with it. But I know I have to deal with it. Um. Look, honestly, you're being quite dishonest with yourself about this. This is what I'm going to talk about next week with mothers. Like the amount of mothers that have come to me saying exactly what you've said, I want to help my son, daughter, whatever, get through their problems. And you've, you, you know the only way you're going to do that is forget completely about your son and daughter, completely, completely about helping them and focus on everything of your creation inside of yourself. Your well, son's anger with you is about you. It's not about him. It's about you. There's yeah. something in you attracting it. Yeah, I know that. I know he's angry with me. Yeah, but see, you said you wanted to help him not... You said you wanted to help him. him. Who do you need to help? Well I, need, uh, well, I try to help myself as well in the no, process. No, 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 no. Stop for a moment. Who is the only person you can help? Me. Yes. But as... If you have children, you are responsible. I do have two children. <laughs> so I'm, I'm, not, I'm not accusing you. I'm just saying, I'm, I wasn't trying to. I'm just saying if one has children, you yeah. want to do the best for them. Why? Because they're your, they, they've come into your life and you no, are looking You've already them. done the damage. Them. You've already done the damage. Have you not? Yeah. Well, so I've how are you going to fix it? That's what you're asking me. How are you going to fix it? No, I just don't know how to deal with the anger that's coming towards you when accept it accept it you yeah. deserve it <laughs> do you understand as parents any anger that is coming from your children towards you you deserve you accept it accept it you created it accept it as I your do creation. accept it, I, it, and the pain is so great. No, 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 you don't accept it yet because you're trying to change him and stop him from being angry. No, I would just try to help him because... No, this is what I'm saying, give up helping him. See, th this is causing you so much pain. And by the way, this is one of the ma main reasons why many women on the Divine Love Path who are mothers have huge trouble with the Divine Love Path. Because at the end of the day, they want to tell me over and over again that they want to help their children, when in reality... They don't, don't want to accept their creation and they don't want to accept that the only person they can help now is themselves and if they help themselves, then things will automatically change. They also don't want to accept that actually the result, all anger coming towards you from your children are the, is the result of your own creation. So how can you have the temerity to think that you can help your child not be angry? Isn't it better to deal with the reason why they're angry, which is actually inside of yourself? The reason why he's angry is inside of you. Yeah, I understand that. I was inadequate. You so, if, no, no, no. See, that's self-blame. And I'm not blaming you here. Self-blame is avoidance of the emotion. Well, I, I, I try not to be um, Can I Can I just address this with you? Yeah. Because the many mothers in the room need to address this. All right? And it's one of the things I'll discuss next week. Two, firstly, self-blame, secondly, blame of others, thirdly, blame of society, fourth, blame of God, am I covering all the bases yet? Every one of those things is just as damaging to your soul. In other words, it's just as damaging to my own soul to blame myself as it is to blame you, as it is to blame society or blame God. All right? Now, so what do I need to do? I need to find inside of me the causal emotional reason that gets triggered when my son is angry with me. And I'm not going to do that by blaming myself. 
No, I feel a failure every time I feel a failure. Yeah, that's, that's blaming yourself. But that's acknowledging that I was a failure because otherwise I wouldn't have an angry son. How many of you got angry sons? Like quite a few of his sons have got angry sons. So they're all failures too? Is this what you're selling me? <laughs> only me. <laughs> only you. Can you see how can that's self-blame? Yeah, can you see that? So, so, so the truth is that self-blame is anger with yourself. And that doesn't help you get to a causal emotion, ever. All right? I'm not suggesting you blame yourself. I'm suggesting that you understand that the causal emotion of his anger is inside of yourself. Now, I'm not blaming you in that because the most likely reason why it was there came from your own childhood and therefore was created by somebody else. It's like it, God says the sins of the father are visited on the, on the son. Exactly. exactly what, that's exactly what I said in the first century. Exactly those words. And this is what I meant by it, is that just because I'm saying to you the causal emotion is now inside of you, I'm not saying to you that you're to blame for that causal emotion being inside of you. But I am saying to you that the only person that can release it is you. D does that make sense to everyone? So I'm not saying that this causal emotion inside of you was because when you were a little two-year-old, you made a terrible choice and you were bad and you were, you know what I mean? I'm not saying that. No, no, no. I'm saying that actually your parents did a lot of damaging things to you as a child. I know, it's a human condition. And I it's a human condition, all right? So, so rather, but we do have to be honest about what is inside of us. And what I'm saying to you is every time you focus on your children, you are taking the focus away from yourself. And every time you do that, you take away your power to actually heal the problem. Every time. Every time you focus on trying to help fix something inside of your child, you are actually taking away your power from actually fixing the situation which exists inside of yourself. It is a basic thing to remember as a parent. So whenever my sons have been angry with me, I've accepted their anger in its full force and fury. Me? I have. I'm talking me. Oh, right. I've got two sons who are grown up, and any time they've been angry with me, I've accepted their anger and rage in its full force and fury. I've allowed them to yell and scream and swear if they wanted to. What if they you know, want to banish you from your life? You know, and just... I've allowed them to do that too. Sorry? What if they came towards you physically? You've allowed that to happen too? Well, they haven't done that, so I can't say what I would have done in that circumstance. I'm just saying what I have done. Right? And you just, while you're in that position, are you then feeling their anger or are you feeling your emotion inside? No, I'm feeling my repentance. I'm feeling, okay. I'm feeling that actually their anger is my creation. Like, I created this anger in my sons. So you're, feeling, you're actually feeling that as that anger is being directed to Yeah, you. that's why my sons don't get angry with me anymore. <laughs> yeah, I can understand that, but uh, would they, knowing my sons, they would accuse me of not listening to them at that point if I was concentrating not on them. I'm not, I'm not saying you know, I wasn't concentrating on them. I was, yeah. I'm saying to my sons, yes, you're right, I have done that. Yes, you're right, I did that too. And yes, I've even said to them things that they didn't even realise about what I've created in them. So I've said to them things like, wow, you know, you know this trouble you're having with this girlfriend of yours? Well, I created that. Because that's the way I taught you how to deal with women. Actually, I've done that with my kids. I've, I've said to them, you know, the things that I have done. So why are you still trying to help them? See, see, you're not giving up trying to help them, which means that you think you can help them and actually you created a lot of their, their emotional problems. So how can you help them without firstly dealing with yourself? Completely dealing with yourself. Yeah. So you need to give up trying to help them. Completely. Like there's an emotional reason why you want to help them. What is it? Can you see what it is? It's about you feeling good as a mum. It's not about them at all. Oh, no, I feel, I feel so sad for their lives. You know, like, 
Yeah, but see, see, if you were really sad, you'd be sad about what you did to their lives. I am sad about that too. So, so there's no need for you to help them. All you need to do is feel that sadness. When you really feel that sadness, they will feel that mum is repentant. Right. Because at the moment, you're not really feeling that sadness. What you're doing is you're feeling that you can help them. And I it's, think I'm feeling it. You know, like I feel as if I've, I've, I've felt in the past as if I was feeling it, but probably I'm not feeling it no. adequately. When you feel fully repentant, your children will stop being angry with you. You try it. The only time they'll stop being angry with you is when you're fully repentant. It's a beautiful law of God, another one of God's laws. If my children are still angry with me, it means that I'm not repentant yet. I haven't seen the full extent of the damage that I've done yet and I haven't owned it inside of myself. And I haven't changed the causal emotional reason why I did that damage inside of myself. So why, why did I do this damage to boys, to, to men? They're now men, but they were boys at some point. What do I think about men? What's the emotions that I have as a woman about men? Because that's the damage that was given to them. Does that make sense? So if I feel men are mongrels and men are cheaters and men are... No, let me finish. I'm not saying you feel this. I'm saying if I felt this, if I feel that men are going to leave me, men are going to control me, men any of the beliefs I have about men are all being projected at those boys. And they don't deserve those beliefs, but they're all entering them. And they will have those beliefs. And I need to look at, if they're angry with me, it's because I'm not sorry for some things yet. When I get into full repentance, then things will change. The time when I got into full repentance, my boys were 13 and 11, and things, um, sorry, 15 and 13 they were, and um, things just changed from that moment on. Until that point in time, they will be angry, they will be upset. My boys didn't speak to me for two years, between the age, uh, those ages. And some of it was not anything to do with me. It was about things that other people told them, but there were still emotions in me that created that. I created within them a desire to pander to their mother. I created within them a desire to pander to religious figures. I created in them the desire to see the male as not very important in their life for a period of time. I created in them these things. I needed to feel my own emotions about them. During that time, I didn't go get on the phone and say, I want to help you get over this rage you have with me. Oh, I never say that. No, but you're, this is what you're doing. Yeah. It's coming from you. It's coming from you, this statement, I can help you. And they're going, how can you help me? You created it. How can you help me? The only way you're going to be able to help me is to actually accept fully emotionally that you created it and not go into self-blame because that's not accepting. Not going into blame of others because that's not accepting either. Does that make sense? Like, yeah, I, I, I find it hard to find the difference between self-blame and repentance because what are you repenting for if you're not blaming yourself? You know, if you're not recognising that you've created... I've, I've had a whole discussion on repentance that you can download and listen to. But repentance is all about dealing with the causal emotional reason why you did what you did. So, so, so it's one thing for me to sit there and go, oh boy, you know, my boys are feeling like uh, that... You know, they've got to look after the women in their life and they've got to pander to whatever the woman says. Let's say that's what my boys feel. And I'm sitting there, I can feel self-blame about it by going, oh, you stupid idiot, why did you, you, know, why did you teach them that? Or I can go into the actual emotional reason why I taught them that, which was this thing in me that men are responsible for women's pain. Men are responsible for women's, you know, like the terrible feelings women have. And it was inside of me and I needed to feel it. When I felt it, I was repentant. When I'm repentant, my boys automatically felt the emotion. Leave me and could treat me differently after that. Does that make sense? That's what happens. You need to feel the causal emotional reason inside of yourself as to why you took the action you took that created the events that were created, that created the damage inside of the children. Do you follow me? Yep. And, and the majority of parents don't want to. What we want to do instead is we want to help our children not have anger with us anymore. Or we, want, we feel, oh, the anger's terrible. Like, I don't feel the anger's terrible. I feel the anger is understandable. So I don't even say to my boys, oh, do you realise by being angry you're avoiding the underlying emotion? I don't even say that. 
I just say, yes, I can understand why you're so angry because I did do this. And not only did I do this, I often list five other things I did that they have not even thought about yet, right? That I know that I've done too, right? And let myself be humble enough to feel that emotionally. And I don't need to cure their anger or their rage or their life. Or I'm, I'm, And the fact is that you believe that you're the only person that can help them. And while on one side, the way you're helping them is not the way to do it. The only way you can help them is by doing it inside of yourself. And the truth is that even if you didn't do that, your boys are totally capable of dealing with their emotions even without you doing it. So the truth is that it's immaterial. You're like... There, there is so much emotion on the planet about being a mum that is very damaging to children. And this is one of the things I want to go through next week, is there is so much emotion about it that damages our children so much and we have no idea what we're doing and saying half the time as, as parents and particularly mothers seem to do this a lot. And the reason why is that mothers is like this, the holy grail of parenthood. Mother, you know, the father, you're allowed to get pissed off and angry with him, right? But the mother, oh, that's sacred. You can't get upset and angry with her. But the majority of the population on this planet are angry with their mothers. And there's an old next week show why that's the case, right? And we need to work our way through the emotions of why. But as mothers, we can do a great deal, or fathers for that matter, we can do a great deal in alleviating these emotions by taking full responsibility of our creation and dealing with the causal emotional reason inside of ourselves and stop focusing on our children's problems. By focusing on our children's problems, what we're doing is we're saying, I can still help you fix this problem. And it's a heap of crap. You created it. How can you help them fix it without you fixing it in yourself first? Does that make sense? Like, so, so we've got to stop as parents telling ourselves that we're capable of helping our children. We aren't capable of helping our children until we release the underlying emotional cause within our own soul as to how that thing got created. That's the only time, from that time, that's the only time that we're capable of helping our child. So when you say the words, I'm trying to deal with my own emotions, my suggestion is give up dealing with any of your children's emotions and just do your own emotions, that's all. Because when you release your own emotion fully, you will actually, that will be the only thing that will benefit the child. And that will be felt by them, you won't have to say a word. It'll be felt. Mom, boy, mum's changed. I can feel mum's not resistive about this anymore. I can feel she's really owning the damage she did. I can feel... And that causes the heart of the receiver to soften. That's what it does. It allows the heart of the person who's had the damage done to them to soften. The alternative is I go up and I punch Brian in the nose, right? Yeah, see, he didn't even expect that. And I, punched him in the, I punch him in the nose and then I tell him, oh, I want to help you sort out the emotions that you have as a result of that. <laughs> now, does that sound very fair to you? This is what we're doing as parents. We're punching our children in the nose, really. That's what we're doing from an emotional soul perspective. And then we're going up to them and saying, oh, I'm going to help you deal with that. <laughs> Can you see, like, how does that feel from a receiving point of view if somebody did that to you? Wouldn't you go, F off? <laughs> and this is why many of our children do go that. Like, they do get, get lost. Because at the end of the day, they know the truth, and that is that I punch them in the nose, right? And they feel the pain of that. And unless I'm willing to go, not only, wow, I punched you in the nose, Brian. I'm sorry about that. But not only do that, I'm willing to actually address the reason why I punched him in the nose. Now he can feel that it's never going to happen again. Does that make sense? And when he can feel it's never going to happen again, any anger he has with me will probably dissipate a lot more rapidly than any time before then. But if he feels that, he's going to ha that it's going to happen again because I haven't dealt with the underlying emotion, he's going to go, oh, this AJ character, I think I'll stay away from him, you know, and he'd be walking around. Now, it's the same with our parents and with children, exactly the same. They have been punched in the nose by us over and over and over and over and over again, usually for 20 years plus. 
That's how, and, and many of us as adult parents with adult children are still punching our children in the nose. Still, right now, because of the emotions that we're yet to release. Right? Now, we've got to at some point stop punching them in the nose. That's one action we've got to do. But how dare we then go up to them and say, oh, I'm going to help you deal with the results of my punches. That's pretty arrogant, isn't it, to say that to them? Isn't it better go, I am going to deal with every single emotional reason inside of myself why I did that. That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to deal with every single feeling inside of me that created me, it was in me, a desire to harm you or even an unconsciousness of the fact that I'm harming you. I'm going to deal with all of that. That's, what I, that's my promise to you. Now that's going to have a far greater effect on our children than ever helping them is going to have. Now, what I've found with that with my, with my sons is exactly that. Like, as soon as I was willing to go into that place and go into the place of actually dealing with the causal emotions inside of me as to why I punched them in the nose, not that I did that physically, so I need to clarify that for everyone who wants to misquote me. And then, <laughs> But the truth is that I did damage my children. Now, I did, I did physically damage them, when they were little, we give them a tap on the backside like many of us have done as parents, right? And so I've done that. But I've also, more importantly, damaged them emotionally, punched them in the nose emotionally speaking. And how dare I then go along to them and say, I'm going to help you. Can you feel the arrogance of that place? Like, that's a very arrogant place and it's no wonder most children resist it. Um, and you can understand why. When you, you do the opposite, what happens is the, ch the child sees the changes in you, feels the changes in you, and they feel the relief. Ah, oh, mum or dad is now not going to be able to hurt me anymore on this subject. Like They're not going to be able to because the original reason why they did hurt me is gone inside of them. Now, now when that happens, now we've got something to work with. And that's when actually your children will seek you out. They will seek you out, not to hammer you with rage, but they'll actually seek you out for healing. Oh, they, they do seek me out all the time. Have you got help. a microphone? Oh, sorry. They do seek me out all the time for help, so I'm called to help all the time. Um, yeah, but you want them to. You want to help them. Yeah, but I don't want to. I don't want to. Um, I'm saying. I'm saying. Give up trying to help them. So if they're asking for help and when I... I'll be, be honest. How can I help you when I did the damage? I've got no idea how to help you. I've, I've got to work through why, how I did the damage. Like, that's, that's the honest truth. How can I help a child when I did the damage to the child and I haven't yet resolved why I did the damage? I can't help them. I need to say to them, look, I can't help you. I've done terrible damage to you and I've realised that I actually can't help you. And I know that feels terrible, but that's the truth. I can't help you because I did it. I did this damage and I've got to look at the reason inside of myself why I did this damage first before I can help you. I need to solve why I did it in me before I can actually help you. So when they demand help of you, how can you help them? Just say the truth. I can't help. The reason why you want to help is so that you can feel good about the damage you did. That's the reason why you want to help. No? And, th and this is the reason why most parents want to help, because so that they can feel good about it again. And, that's so, and we only do that as parents because we don't want to feel bad. No? And what we need to do is feel the real feelings inside of ourselves rather than expecting us to be able to fix our children's lives again. And it's, it, it, if you can just think of that analogy... Every time I punch Brian in the nose and then go up to him afterwards and say, let me fix that, that's not a very nice place, is it? Right? But if I, if I punch Brian in the nose, and, either accidentally or on purpose, and I go, I'm so sorry, Brian, that I punched you in the nose, that's firstly an acknowledgement of my action. Then secondly, I say, and I, and I mean it, I actually say, I'm going to deal with every emotional reason inside of myself of why I punched you in the nose so it never happens again. Now Brian's got something to work with. 
Can you see that? And if you remember that analogy as a parent, you will go a long way to resolving a lot of the issues you have with your own children. Other than that, you'll just create more problems, more problems, more problems, more anger, more rage, right? because that's what we create when we don't acknowledge what we've done. Fully acknowledge. Yeah? Is there anything else you want to say about it? Well, I am attempting to address my own issues and because of that I'm getting more and more anger from them, from one. Yeah, but see, my, my, what I've said to you is when you really do deal yeah. with your own issues, yeah. you will not get anger from them. So yeah. the fact is that the anger that's coming from them means that there's still issues that need to be dealt with, mm. dealt with inside of you. Does that make sense? Well, you I'm know, saying. like uh, I've listened to you say that sometimes you know might have a uh, problem with men or something like that, and I, I rack my brain to try and figure out where I, you know, because I feel as if I've been through all the feelings of my life, but I know I haven't. But um, your sons are a perfect reflection of the fact that you haven't. Yeah, but I mean, my sons are thirty-six years old. And Doesn't matter. Thirty-six years old. They could be seventy yeah. and still doing this to you, and yeah. that'd be still a perfect yeah. reflection that you haven't healed the stuff with men. You haven't healed the stuff with men. By the way, many processes people go through. You know, lots of uh, you know, some go to Brandon Bay processes, others go to um, what do they call it? Um, anyway, like you know, all the different types of processes, and. And the truth is we come out of it and think, oh, I've healed this now, oh, it's all over. But our law of attraction is telling us what's over. And if I'm still getting rage and anger from men and from particularly from sons or daughters, then it's telling me what's going on. This is not healed. This is not healed inside of me. My law of attraction is perfect. Like it's not some mistake that they're angry with you. When you deal with your own emotion about all of the stuff with men, they may still be angry with women, but they won't be angry with you. Right? The fact that they're angry with you means there is a law of attraction. Here's yourself. Here's your sons. There is a law of attraction going on telling you that you have not healed the stuff with men. It is not healed. And you can tell yourself all you like that it's healed and it's all their problem. That's fine. But while you believe that, it is still going to continue until you heal what's inside of you. And this is why I'm saying, focus on the causal emotion inside of you. That is the only thing that you can actually change and it's the only way in which you can help. I've right? been asking for help Sorry? really strongly from God. You know, I've been asking. Sorry? I have been asking for help to access my emotions. But, you know. <laughs> no, no, see, if you're asking for help and there's no emotions coming up about men in all of this interaction, then you're not being honest with yourself. You've got law of attraction event of men being angry with you, your own sons. And if you're not feeling some emotions underneath of that, rather than trying to prevent their anger, then you're not being honest with yourself. You need to be honest with yourself. There is, if, there's, if, there's, if my sons are being angry with me, that it's there because of an emotion inside of me about men. Now, it might not be that you're angry with men. It might be that you feel conciliatory towards men or that you feel like men control you or you feel like there could be all sorts of stuff in there still, right? And I can feel that there's quite a lot of stuff in there about men. Otherwise, your sons wouldn't be doing this. Does that make sense? Yes, I do. The key is to don't say, oh, but I've been through this process, I've been through that process, I've been through this process, I think I've healed that now. Forget about all of that. Just throw that, all that out. Because that's all just the stories we tell ourselves to make ourselves feel good. Right? What we need to do is look at our law of attraction. Here's our attraction right in front of our face, telling me, unresolved, unresolved. So, like, I'm working through a whole group of emotions at the moment with women being angry with me, right? So what I do is that I'm walking past, I'm walking past, this happened yesterday, the day before yesterday, I was setting up some things for Mary's workshops, and I walked outside, walked past a woman, and she just projected rage at me. She didn't say a word. And I go to myself, hmm, still got something to work on there. There's still something to work on there. My law of attraction just showed me. I've still got something there with women, with rageful women. What's going on there? Does that make sense? Instantly. My law of attraction is showing me. Instantly, in that moment, I've still got something to work on. Right? Forget about all the things you've done in the past. 
just worry about what the law of attraction is bringing you right now. Because whenever you try to go back to the past and say, but I've done this and but I've done that, all you're trying to do is cheer yourself up. That's really all we're trying to do most of the time, is just cheer ourselves up and make ourselves feel better. We need to give that up. The truth is that our law of attraction at any one point in time is automatically displaying to me what the problem is. And to be frank, most of the time, most of us ignore it. Most of us ignore it. Oh, well, oh that's his problem. Oh, that's their problem. Oh, I, I didn't even notice them doing that. <laughs> that's why we do all sorts of things to ignore it, but we ignore it. The more sensitive you become to what's going on in your day-to-day -day life with your law of attraction and own it inside of yourself, the more powerful your progress towards God will become. So if you really want to get close to God very rapidly, notice your law of attraction at every moment. Every moment. Oh, boy, angry woman. Oh, another woman trying to be, you know, control me. Oh, a woman trying to get a sexual projection from me. Oh, you know, all these different things are things inside of me that I can look at. They're all law of attraction. Does that make sense? And we can feel about them and work our way through them um, if we're conscious of them existing. But if we go down the line, oh, I healed that ages ago, it must be their problem. We're just telling ourselves a falsehood. It's never, if I'm involved in a situation, remember I said earlier, even if it's like I'm driving home hearing something on the radio, I'm now involved in that situation and if I'm involved in that situation, there's a law of attraction in that event for me. Doesn't and, and of course, with your own children, it's even like greater. We have the largest law of attraction with them. Does that make Thank sense? Yep. So if you can focus on that and, that, and that's about being humble as a parent, you know, like allowing yourself just to be really humble and, and open, about, open to that. When, when you go into self-blame, not humble anymore. That's not being humble. Self-blame... Often we think self-blame, you know, self-punishment's a humble place. Not a humble place at all. It's an avoidance of the underlying emotional reason why I did it. We blame ourselves or get angry with ourselves in order to avoid the grief of the underlying reason why we did something. In other words, to avoid our shame as parents. Uh, what's the difference between self-blame and shame? So, if you put the mic up so I can... What's the difference between self-blame and shame? Um, shame is an emotion usually related to our childhood in some way or with regard to the emotion, it's linked to the emotion of repentance in the sense that shame allows us to see the wrongness of what we've done and to actually then become sorry by dealing with the underlying reason why we did it. Self-blame is anger with ourselves. And anger with anybody, including ourselves, is a, level, is a layer of denial of our deeper emotion. Self-blame, which is anger with yourself, will never result in a release of a causal emotion, ever. And, and so one way is to give up all self-blame because it's never going to get... It's the same with giving up blame of others. Ne you know, both of them are never going to help you deal with your own emotion. The key is to let yourself feel the shame of what you have done, right? And then allow yourself to see why you did it, why did I do it, and feel and release the underlying reason why, which is a process of repentance. Now we've got something to work with, with anybody, but in, in a, to a great degree with our children. So that that? No worries. Okay. Sorry? Oh, can I have the mic, if we can? And can you put your hand up? <laughs> Thank you. Is it dead, is it? I just, want, I just wanted to ask if you could just repeat that last sentence of repentance again. I just felt myself shut down and I just thought, oh, there was something Why in Why would you shut down? That's what I was trying to ask you. If you said it again, I thought I might be able to feel it a bit more. Well, no, no, let's look at the reason why you shut down first. <laughs> I kind of, I think, okay. You see, everything we don't hear in any discussion yeah. is about something we don't want to hear. Yeah. So why would I not want to hear about repentance, do you think? We were talking about repentance in reality, in respect to being um, a mother. No, well, I'm not a mother. I well, I think it's mother stuff, but not relation to my children because I yep. don't have children. 
Um, it, and it can, was, I, can I correct you? It yes. is always about me. About? Oh, yeah. You're saying it's not in relation to your children. I'm saying it is in relation to your children. Oh, but I don't have children. Well. Oh, okay. The children that come in my path, is that what you mean? It is about something about you. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, my childhood, yeah. Everything is always about you. Yes. The reason why we tune off is always about something inside of us. Yeah. Okay. So when I talk about the word repentance as mm -hmm. a mum, why do you tune out? Because of an anger. It's, I know it's anger-based. So what are you angry about? Um, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. If, if your mum come and said to, and, and actually went through the process of sorrow and repentance, mm -hmm. how would you feel? Um, relieved, I think. Yeah, I suggest you'd still feel angry. Okay, okay, okay. No, that's good. I'm glad you're telling me. Can you me. see that? The reason I'm not why sure is, I can, see, oftentimes we feel like if a person comes and see, if a person sees what they've done, the truth is that they can't feel our emotions. They can't feel the emotions of what we've done, they've done. In the sense, in the sense of this, if I damage you, like if I come along and do what I did to Brian, bop you in the nose, right, yeah. and damage you, there's an emotional feeling that passes through you in that moment. Yeah. Now I can say sorry to you, yeah. and I can even deal with the emotional causal reason inside of myself why I did that to you. Yeah. Can I? Yes. Yeah. But that doesn't mean you're going to forgive me. Does it? No. And you see, most of the time, we don't want to forgive people who are repentant. Have you noticed that in law? Yeah. You notice a person can be like fully processing through things emotionally, fully processing the reason why they did something really damaging to somebody else, and we just want to keep punishing them. We want to send them to prison. We want to murder them, capital punishment. We don't care that they're sorry. And why did we get into that state? Because... We want to continue blaming the person rather than feeling our own emotion. Now, often when I talk about repentance, a lot of people have a lot of resistance to hearing about it because yeah. repentance is a law that God created that enables a person to get, to get away with it, is what people think. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And, and because of that, a lot of times people detune from, okay. from the discussion. So is that why you did tune from the discussion? Well, I think so. Yeah, I'm, I'm still trying to... Can you see that you're not really sure whether you'd want to forgive your mum? I'd, um, um, I'm thinking at this moment that I possibly... Not at the time, like as a child, but I don't think she's ever showed sorrow anyway, like sorry anyway. She hasn't. So, so how, how does that can make I, you feel? Um, sad, upset. Angry. Angry, Okay. <laughs> Well, I have a trouble with angry, and I've noticed that um, my law of attraction is angry women, and I don't, and I, and I shut down, and I don't know what to do. Yeah, and yeah, yeah and that's where I'm at. Yeah, well, you can understand why you'd be angry and upset though about a person not being repentant, can't you? Um, you so see, I'm starting to shut down again. Exactly. <laughs> so you let's state the truth that you don't want to face. Okay. The truth is, okay. Mum is not sorry. Okay. That's the truth you don't want to face emotionally. So I talk about repentance and you go, oh, it would be great if mum was sorry. Oh, mum's not sorry. Oh, I don't want to think about repentance. But I'm, I'm wondering. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't think she's not so I don't think she is sorry. I don't think she, I don't think she is think she has anything to be sorry about. Exactly. So she's not even at that point. She doesn't yeah. even think she's got anything so to be how sorry can about. I, so how can I get angry with her when she doesn't even know what she's doing? Ah, you see what's going on there? Yeah, I, I, can, I feel that I'm answering a question with a question, but I don't know why. Well, rather than talk about the anger, wouldn't it be better to focus on the fact that your mum has demonstrated to you that she is not sorry? She is so not sorry that she even did the, thinks she did the right thing. Yeah, that very much so. She thinks how she's many, done the right thing. How many mums and dads think that? I think Lots well, of them, right? that I'm feeling the projection of anger from her um, as a child, but I'm feeling that that's because she failed. She's feeling her own failure, that she didn't protect me. 
that's what I'm feel. That's what I'm, I'm feeling. A um, anger, yeah. Yeah. and I don't know what to do. Like it's just too powerful. So I'm shut. I'm shutting down. Yeah. But can you see the real issue that the law of attraction has brought you right at this moment? Yeah. Is you don't want to feel the grief of this. Oh, okay. So it's that number one there. You don't want to feel the grief of this. Many of your mothers are not sorry, by the way. Most of them aren't sorry. The majority of them think they did the right thing. Because I feel like that's what's um, bubbling up for me now. Like there's definitely some devastation and I always push it down. Yeah. But I think part of the reason, particularly for the last few months, is like I feel like I'm looking for a safe place to cry, like to, to be devastated. And the truth is that you just need to let yourself feel the devastation. And it doesn't matter where. It doesn't, it doesn't matter where. I've been going to these divine love path groups <laughs> just to do this emotional processing with yeah. other people. Yeah. And some and I, someone will trigger some sadness in me. I start to feel it. And then less than three metres away, someone's going, fucking this and fucking that. And I just shut down again. So can you see your mum is even angry about your being sad? Yeah. And that's what's shutting you down? Yeah. You think if you're sad, then she's just going to get even more angry, which is probably right. Yeah. Because your mum feels, as soon as you start Very crying... Very controlling. I've, feels... I've never seen my mum cry. And my mum has yeah. always shut... She would have been one of these patterns of babies. Your, your mum hates sadness. Yeah, my mum like, hates emotion. <laughs> hates sadness. Like, okay. I use the word hate specifically. She's saying, yeah. She hates sadness. Yeah. So she hates anyone who de demonstrates sadness. Okay. So she's going to hate you while you're sad. Yeah. And there's an emotion in you about that. That's why when you start crying, other people get angry because that's the law of attraction at work. What you need to do is continue crying, even though they're yeah. angry. I know, Does that make sense? It, it makes a lot of sense. Like, but I always pull myself away. I never, never really so cry. just let yourself keep crying. Let yourself go back into it every single time because it's just a law of attraction event this is how your mother controlled your sadness by getting angry with it right your mother is not sorry for what she's done and there's a lot of grief in you about that so let yourself feel it okay thank you yeah it's going to be really powerful if you feel it um you'll get you'll get past this shutting yourself down because of her you can use the mic again if you wish oh okay Yep. So when you go, when you go, we go to coughs, she'll be do, doing a bit of workshop work with you. But in the end, if you can feel a bit of this emotion, yeah. it's going to help you immensely. Yep. Yep. What is the time? Uh, nearly 5.30. Okay. Jen. I would rather be sick than and die then feel the emotions to do with my mother. Um, and if, if I turn to the medical profession for can help... I, can I just address that statement, Jen? That is a very dramatic statement, purposefully done in order to gain sympathy from others, is it? but totally untruthful. Because you'd already be dead if that was the case. I was trying to be... Well, you're saying you'd rather be sick and die than feel your mum's stuff. That's how it feels at the moment. But it's not true. But I'm ill. You, 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 no, you're feeling your mum's stuff every day and you're not sick and dead. You're feeling the results of your mum's so stuff. So is it tr day. more truthful to say that I'm blocked about this? Yeah, you're certainly blocked about it, certainly. Yeah. Okay. So... Why do you want to make the dramatic statement? Because you want everyone in the audience to feel how bad you feel about your mum. Does that make sense? That's why the dramatic statement was made. It had nothing to do with the truth. So let's be real about the statement. The statement was there to garner sympathy from others about how bad you feel about your mum's stuff. Right? Okay. Wouldn't it be more honest just to say, I feel really bad about my mum's stuff and I'm really struggling to feel it? Isn't that the truth? I actually didn't think that that was really part of the question. <laughs> well, then let's continue to the question. If you turn to the medical profession for assistance mm -hmm. because the situation becomes life-threatening, 
does that compound the situation the becomes life threatening because you'd rather suicide? N no. Is that what you're saying? Or what? Oh, it's suicide. <laughs> no, that's okay. Keep keep talking, Jim, if you can. Can I just point out that suicide is blame of others? If we would rather die than deal with an emotion, that's the extent of rage that we have towards wanting others to deal with the emotion for us. Can you see that? We are so, so strongly wanting someone else to deal with the emotion for us that we're prepared to die rather than feel it ourselves. That's the extent of the rage that's in us about feeling our own, having to feel our own emotion. Does that make sense to everyone? So, so understand that every time I have these suicidal feelings, again, I've got to see it as blame of others. It's me acting out blame of others. And, and I'm doing that, why? Blame of others is anger with others. I'm in a rage with others. Why? Because I feel that I'm incapable of dealing with this emotion myself. That's in the end the truth. The truth is that God created you totally capable to deal with every emotion. So you are capable of dealing with all the levels of grief that's inside of you about what happened with mum and dad. Right? Now, the reason why the mum issue is very big for many people is because mum spent huge amounts of time with us compared to dad. Now, often dads, you know, they got up at early in the morning, went off to work, so there's an there's eight-hour slice that they weren't with us, right? Come home, he comes home at five, six, has a shower, whatever, gets dressed, mum's already cooked the dinner. By, by a lot of times when we're little, by the time it's 7.30 or 8.30, we're in bed, right? So how many of the hours of the day did dad get to influence our life? One. One, maybe two. How many hours did mum get to influence our life? 10, 12, 13, 14, 15 hours. Can you see straight away the influence that mum will have over our life and over our emotions compared to dad? Just from that. So dad might, we might have a lot of absent emotions with dad, but trust me, the emotions you're going to have with your mum are going to be much greater in today's society than the emotions you have with your dad. Right? And the, re the reason is quite obvious. We spend more time with her. And therefore, every emotional injury she has gets transmitted to us pretty, pretty well because of all the time that we spend with her. Does that make sense? So, and it's a product of, of un the unfortunate uh, way society is built today in that if, if the male was at home as much as the female was at home, then obviously there would be more balanced damage, if you like, done to the child. Sorry? So, but, but just in terms of time, uh, we're going to have a lot more issues to deal with our mothers than our fathers, generally. Now, that's not always the case, because sometimes the father's brought us up. So, obviously, it's then the father that's going to have a large influence on us rather than the mother. So, but, but generally, that's the case. So, so understand that if the reasons why we don't want to deal with our mum issues often are because inside of ourselves, we know that our mum issues are the biggest. Right? And we know that we need, you know, we know that we've got a lot to deal with there. So, as a percentage, if you want to know percentage for the average person, and for the average sort of nuclear family being brought up, the uh, the average percentage is usually about eighty percent of our emotions are mums, and twenty percent are dads. And you can see that for many, dads are even less because they were hardly home at all. Right? And the big emotion that most people have to do with their dads is a feeling of abandonment. Right? But with mums, there are literally a whole list of emotions that we often have to do with because of the day-to-day -day stuff that happened. Unfortunately, the majority of us are totally willing to deal with our mum, our dad emotions because society has a lot of uh, loose uh, feelings about dads and society basically says that, uh, that you know, anything you got with dad, you know, he deserves. We, we were trying, myself and Mary the other day, we were trying to look at 
look for songs to deal with emotions with your mum. And it was so hard. Like, Mary spent nearly seven hours looking for a trigger song to deal with mum's stuff with, with people so that she could incorporate it into her workshops. And, uh, and we found hundreds of songs promoting the mother relationship instead. We found this, interestingly, a lot of religious songs saying, next to God, your mum is the next person you've got to listen to. Yep. And it was just went on and on and on and on. And we were both so surprised about what kind of messages the human race is really getting, even through music, about you know this the sanctity of mum. And if you think about it, if, if a person openly addresses an issue with their mother, that's when they get the most pressure generally, isn't it? Like, uh, like I know many, many fathers and many like sons will come and rush to mum's rescue if you start dealing with your emotions with your mum. Right? And this is one reason why I want to discuss it in detail next week. Anyway, it's a big issue, yeah. So if you feel that uh, um, your dad issues have been like the hardest, then uh, most of us will have to rethink that because most of our issues relate to the person we've spent the most time with. I'm finding in, in my own work that, and I don't know if it's relevant, but it seemed like I had this realisation, say, for example, that um, it, it was very painful that my father, there was a loss of innocence around the fact that I only had value as a woman because my fa that's how my father valued women or what my father va valued women for. And my mum's in the spirit world and I'm feeling her more and I've started to realise that's how she felt about men. Totally. So when you say our father emotions and our mother emotions, I'm actually having trouble. Well, let's think. You spent 80% of your time with your mum, let's say, right? The average person. Which is right. right. Yeah. right. Now, mum has emotions about men in her and emotions about women in her. Does that make sense? And because you spent 80% of your time with, men, with your mum, you are going to have 80% of mum's emotions about men and you're going to have 80% of mum's emotions about women. In other words, your mum has been the most influential person in your beliefs about men, not your relationship with your dad, actually. In fact, many women, when they're in a relationship with a man, as a, they are projecting their dad issues on the man. So, so, and this is the same if I'm a woman, if I'm a man in a relationship with a woman, I'm often projecting my mum issues on the woman. Does that make sense? So here I am in a relationship, there's, there's the man and there's the woman in the relationship. What I'm actually talking, what, what I'm feeling about her is not actually about her. Most of the time it's about my mother. Right? And what she's feeling about him is not actually often about him. It's actually about her father. But she's also attracted someone like my dad. Of course. Because of her emotions. So About her father who I've also connected, probably sexually abused her quite extensively. Yeah. So what happens is you take on 80% of mum's emotions. So 80% of your men-based beliefs came from your mother, not from your father. That's what I'm starting to realise. Yeah. And 80% of your women-based beliefs came from your mother too, not from your father. And 20% of them came from your father. So my thinking or my musing has been that it's not really how important is it to go, oh, I got that from my mum or oh, I got that from my dad. It doesn't seem to matter because in what I'm finding in my own work... Well, the only way it matters a... is if mum is like a holy grail and, and, and sacred and I can't touch any issue to do with mum, can you see that if I have that belief in me, that it's going to heavily influence my processing emotionally. Okay. Yep. All right? So, And most of us do have that belief. The whole human race, in fact, has this belief that mums, because they carried us, are sacred and you can't attack a mum. You know, mum, you know who, who's the first person to get off of, a, off of anything that's in danger? A pregnant mother, of course. 
I've been attacking my mum for uh, years. So. <laughs> well, the truth is, emotionally, the majority of us have most of our issues with our mother. Mm. And the reason, that's the reason why many women spend their entire life trying to not be like their mother and they become like their mother because they have most of mum's emotions. Yeah, I've noticed Does that. that. Mean sense? I've, yeah, I've noticed that yeah, too. And, and many, many men in this generation, uh, because obviously women are even having more influence now, a lot of single mums and so forth, many men in this generation have lots of issues with women as a result of their relationships with their mum. And, uh, and then they go and project that on the next generation of women, of course which is very damaging. Yep. So, so I'm not saying, by the way, that men are only responsible for 20% of the problems in the world. So don't, don't make that assumption. Uh, I'm saying that, that 80%... So a lot of your mum's emotions come from men. Does that make sense? Like, obviously, a woman who's getting raped all of her marriage is going to have lots of issues with men. Is she not? Uh, but... If you're a girl child born to that woman, if you're a girl born to that woman who's been raped all of her life in her marriage by a man, then of course you're going to have lots of issues with men about sex. Does that make sense? But they didn't come necessarily from the men you are with in your life. They came from your mum's emotions towards her relationships with men. Does that make sense? Anyway, we'll talk a lot more about that next week. I've got a lot to say about that. Mary's got a lot to say about it too. I'm looking forward to that actually. Yeah, yeah. And what we find, you know, there's this whole thing in New Age spirituality about the sacred feminine. Yeah? What, what's, what's happening with the sacred masculine? Like, where did that go? Yeah, exactly. See, see this is the trouble is that we have this, we have this viewpoint some, for some reason that, you know, there's the sacred feminine but the masculine isn't sacred. The truth is that none of it's sacred until you're made holy by God's love entering you. That's the truth. And the truth is that a male or a female can become sacred in that regard. Like they can be the, the perfect masculine example of a male or the perfect example of a female once you become at one with God. So, so while we hold on to this definition of sacred femininity, what we're actually doing is preventing people from dealing with the emotions about femininity that they need to deal with most of the time. And a lot of those emotions are pretty dark, very dark emotions. And in fact, the whole sacred feminine type of movement that happened in the New Age, in the New Age movement is all about a lot of injuries that are not being dealt with. Uh, as are most other movements on the planet, right? So, sorry. Sacred feminine's been in the Catholic Church for two thousand years. So. Yeah, but, but see, again, you look you look at how damaging it's been. Like mm -hmm. to them, the sacred feminine is a woman who doesn't have sex, or if she does have sex, she has a baby every time. That's the sacred feminine. And 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 look at how my mum had a baby. She didn't have one with a man. She had one with God. Right? And they even say that my mum never had any other children, and yet in the Bible itself it says that she had quite a lot of other children, that I had brothers and sisters, it says. Right? So right from that stage, this, there's, there's been this belief system imposed upon women that if you have sex, you're not sacred, and, and, that, and that, um, you know, that sex is a bad thing, and there's all these false beliefs. And so what we have instead is a kickback now in the New Age movement of, yeah, you can have sacred sex with anybody. And that's the kickback. It's not true either. The truth is that at the end of the day, you can only have sacred sex with the person you love. Right? And I mean in a one-on-one -on -one sort of relationship. And like, so all this tantra sex that goes on, you know, with multiple partners and all those kind of things, that's not sacred either, although people believe that it is. It's not. And, and it's not because it's not based upon love. It's just as simple as that. But, but you can see how these are all just kickbacks from the religion in the end. It's all just coming from these old, old, old false beliefs on the other end. You know, the, the false belief that if a woman has sex, she's no longer sacred and, and holy. A lot of men even do this. A lot of men marry a woman and then lose their desire for her sexually. That's what often happens. Why does that happen? Because... 
a married woman is viewed as a sacred object religiously and then becomes a person who the man feels that he's not allowed to be interested in sexually. He feels guilt about being interested in her sexually. And all of these things come from false beliefs that have just been perpetuated down and become a part of us emotionally. Yeah. But we'll deal with some of those next week. Anyway, it's probably time to finish, eh? You want to have one question here? Really quick. It was a quick question, but is the answer quick? That's the uh... <laughs> It's not to do with mums or anger or such. To what extent do your dreams reflect the condition of your soul? Um, two forms of dreams. Um, I've answered this question a few times, but two forms of dreams. What are they? One is a dream which is about an unresolved emotion in your awake state and the other is an actual event in your sleep state. That's the only two forms of so-called dreams that you have. The one is either is a dream which is about an unresolved emotion in your awake state. So, for instance, every night you go to bed, you have it go to sleep and you have chasing me dreams. You know those kind of dreams? You know, people are chasing you and nothing gets resolved. Or every night you go to bed and you, you have wee dreams where you're doing, sitting on the toilet and you're embarrassed every time. You know, the door's never high enough or someone's looking at you or whatever. So all of those are about unresolved emotions in your awake state. Does that make sense? And then there's the other thing is where they're actual sleep state experiences. Many of us have sleep state experiences we can remember and, uh, and they're actual events that happen when you're asleep. Um, so when you're asleep, you leave your body, you leave your physical body here on earth to rest and you and your soul, your spirit body and your soul, go and do the things in the spirit world that it does, depending on where your condition is, will depend on where you can go. And then when your body starts waking up, you come back to the body. Now, in that sleep state place, you can remember actual sleep state experiences. Make sense? Yep. Now, my suggestion is always focus on any one of them, focus on the emotions you feel when you wake up. Because it's the emotions you feel when you wake up that you're probably avoiding in your day-to-day -day life. So, so if you have dreams about your children dying, for example, and you wake up, it doesn't mean your child's going to die next week. It means that you have some fears inside of yourself and terrors inside of yourself that you're not dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis about children dying that are affecting your life. And you need to deal with it. Does that make sense? Yeah. So just allow yourself to feel them. Okay, well, thank you for putting up with my ramblings today. There are probably more ramblings than usual.